Open back up to Romans again, starting in chapter 2 today. Uh, chapter 2 of Romans deals a whole lot with the judgment of God. The Lord willing, we'll look at the first three verses. Romans 2, verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. For we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that the judge that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Amen. Here he deals with some with the hypocrites. He begins to talk about the judgment of God. He begins with, therefore, thou art inexcusable. That is, going back to the end of chapter 1 here, how that man has this understanding of good versus evil, right versus wrong. He says, because of that man is without excuse. The same as he had. Much like he said back in verse 20 of chapter 1, he said, because God has revealed himself in creation, the man is without excuse. So, for, so too is man without excuse because God has given him this conscience. Amen. Because man cannot plead before God that he was ignorant of what was right and wrong. <laughs> Lord willing, we'll see later on, God has already wrote those things on man's heart. No man will not have a defense before God when he gets to the judgment to say, well, God, I didn't know any better. Right. Just natural man is skewed in his understanding of God and right. God's law, but yet the basics of good versus evil, man still has conviction within our box. Amen. And he says, Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. That is, man here, he's addressing those who are judging others because, as we'll see in a moment, they were not judging, it, judging correctly. Most but specifically, he said, those who are judging others it will be without excuse because they are, they are in their mind determining right versus wrong, and yet they are not right themselves. Right. We can. He also says, whosoever thou art to do this, he doesn't leave any out there. That any and all really will be without excuse before God. Amen. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 7 for just a moment here. Matthew 7, first two words of Matthew 7, I quote it more than anything now, it seems like. Right. It used to be that everyone knew John 3 16, but now I think everyone knows Matthew 7 1, right? We'll read the first five verses. It says, Judge not. If you be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what me measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the boat as in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? And how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the boat out of thine eye, and beholdest the beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then Thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mode of thy brother's eye. Amen. Everyone runs with that judge not. You can't judge me. Then. Hmm. That's really not what Christ is saying here. Here, as well as in our text, it's judging correctly, not judging hypocritically. When he says, Judge not that you be not judged, for whatsoever, for what, what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. So if we judge hypocritically, we can expect the same done to us. He, in the verses 3 through 5, he tells us about we are, how we're worried about the boat that's in our brother's eye, the, the little splinter. We have a, a beam in our own eye. But, right. 
We cannot clearly see ourselves, and yet we are trying to tell someone else that they are wrong, and that we are guilty of the same or even worse, and yet we are telling others that they are in the wrong. So judgment can be done correctly, as we'll see later on, but we must first make sure we are right before we can judge it. Amen. We must first make sure that we are not as the hypocrites, that we are not condemning others for the same thing that we're doing. The judgment is just really calling right from wrong, isn't it? It's right. The condemnation is pronouncing judgment against evil, which really only God can do. I said people want today want to say, well, only God can judge me. That should be a very scary thought, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Amen. The man might not judge correctly, but man doesn't judge near as far as God will. Amen. Let's go back to our text for just a moment again. Romans 2, verse 1, he says, For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. And in their casting of judgment on others, they're really pronouncing judgment against them, their own selves. Uh, just for illustration, I saw went over to Brother Junior's house and saw a bit of whiskey in his cabinet. And I wouldn't, you know, if I said, "Well, Brother Junior must be hitting the bottle," and then I'm <laughs> out drinking on Saturday night or something, I would be not right in judging him in that would I? I'm kind of reminded of, of after Brother Rich passed away. Scotty Richardson came to clean out his personal belongings. Of it. He found the communion wine in the closet and thought Brother Rich was hitting on the bottle, so he took it with him. To... <laughs> you know, I think his, his intentions might have been right, but he had, didn't have the correct type of judgment there. <laughs> we cannot, you know, I cannot. Uh, condemn someone when I'm guilty of the same thing. Or, I think sometimes we, we're not careful, we will, we like to call out sin, yet we're not too careful to call out our own sin. Right. And that's where we end up in the wrong. We end up violating the principles that Christ taught there in Matthew 7, 1, and 1 through 5. And, or as Paul is saying here, we're condemning ourselves because we're judging others and we're guilty of the same thing. Right. We ought to be, we surely ought to call sin what it is, but we ought to be careful that we don't have that very same sin in our own lives. Mm -hmm. We need to, to make sure we are right before God before we go on telling others about how they're not right before God. Amen. Say, for where thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things, that they are guilty of the very same thing that they're pronouncing judgment upon others for. That they're just like we saw there in Matthew 7, they're calling out the moat in the, in the brother's eye when they have a beam in their own eye. Right. I think sometimes it's our our way of maybe justifying ourselves as we try to call out the bad in others that we might feel better about our own selves. Right. In the flesh, of course, but we are not doing ourselves, neither are other service, we are acting in such manners. Amen. <coughs> well, let's go on to verse, or the end of verse 1. There he says that thou. Thou judges do us the same things. You know, most of us will say, well, I've, I'm not guilty of committing this or committing that. So, oftentimes, if we are honest, we've had those, those wicked thoughts or we've had mm -hmm. just as bad, if not, we could say, worse sins. 
well, if we are, we can accuse them. We should not be calling out, you know, maybe the adulterer if we are adulterers in our thoughts. For right. Amen. But we should not be calling out the one who's laying out of church if we are really coming just to be seen. Yeah. Sometimes we might, might not be committing the sin the same way they are, but yet. We're really guilty of the same, aren't we? Amen. Let's go over to John for chapter 7 for just a moment. We can look at what is correct judgment. John chapter 7, verse 24, and we'll look at Luke chapter 7. I know in our day and age, using the word judge is sometimes taboo subject. We should avoid it all costs, some people think, but notice what Christ tells his disciples in John 7, verse 24. He says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Amen. There is a right way to judge, a proper way to, to judge things. But he says it's not according to appearance, but it's according to righteousness. It's really, we should not judge based on the things we see and think, but rather what God's Word has to say. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately that's what all will be judged against, is what God's Word is, His standard. If we go back to chapter 7 of Luke, we'll see. A more practical example. Sometimes we... We think the word judging means always just condemning others, and that's not what it always means. Right. Luke chapter 7, verse 40. We'll read through verse 43. It says, And Jesus answered and said unto Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. We would say, he had, I've got a bone to pick with you. I've got a matter to discuss with you. And he saith, Master, say on. Verse 41, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. Amen. And he said unto him, Thou hast judged, for thou hast rightly judged. Good. To judge rightly is just simply to make the correct conclusion about the right. matter. Amen. To come to the right understanding and end of what something is. What we call sin for sin, and that's that is a right judgment. Now if we say, well, it's okay, God will just look over that. That's not a right type of judgment. Amen. Well, Peter it came to the right and the right judgment here by what Christ had told him that the one would love him more than the other because he forgave him more. But if we were we really remember that God has forgiven us much. Amen. That we must also forgive much. That we should not be too harsh to our brothers and sisters. In fact, the command is to the brother or sister be overtaken of fault. You which are spiritual, restore such a one. Considering thyself, lest they also be tempted. Amen. Let's go on back to our text in Romans, and we'll look here because oftentimes we are. We forget, I guess you could say, that we are just sinners saved by grace. It is only grace that causes us to differ. It is only Amen. grace that keeps us really from falling to sin. Verse 2, he says, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to, the, according to truth against them which commit such things. Amen. He says, Well, we are sure. There's a lot of things in this world you can be unsure about, but when it comes to God and the characteristics of God, and including his judgment, 
We can be very certain about those things. Amen. They are real, that they are true, that he is not going to waver from what he has said. And we oftentimes make, especially as parents, sometimes empty threats, don't we? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we make empty promises. Sometimes we say things we don't mean. And yet, it's never true with God. Amen. He's not always is true to his promises. He's always true to his, quote, threatenings as well. God says that he will judge sin. You can be sure he will judge it. Amen. He says, we are sure that the truth of God, or that the judgment of God is according to truth. That God does not judge according to feelings. He doesn't judge according to societal standards. He doesn't Amen. judge according to how we put our own spin on things. But yet he judges completely in accordance with truth. Like I said, oftentimes we are guilty of judging others why we put our own kind of spin on things to make ourselves look better, don't we? Right. But God's not going to buy that story when he judges. He's not going to be a, I hope you've ever served on jury duty. When I was on this trial a year or so ago, I heard both sides, they both put their own spin on things, make their cells look better, didn't they? Mm -hmm. so the difference in man's judgment and God's judgment is he knows exactly the truth. Amen. When we stand before him, we won't be able to say, well, God, this is really what I meant to do. But this is really what happened. God already knows. And that should be a sobering thought, just with, even more so to the, to the unsaved. That we're not going to be able to explain away our, our sins and our shortcomings. No, he will judge in accordance with standards of his word. That he's not going to say, well, you lived in the 21st century America, so it's okay if you did this. Hmm. Right? He's not going to say, well, you had a hard life, so I understand. The standards of God, they don't waver. There's no gray areas. Amen. And his judgment will be according to those things. He says, the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. God will judge the lawbreaker as well as the hypocrite, won't he? Amen. He's good. Judge those who are openly wicked and those who are self righteous the same. You know, certainly wicked men such as you know, Stalin and Hitler, and those will get their judgment. But so will the Pharisees, so will the Amen. Those who think themselves better than others, so even the some of the quote best Christians you might know, yet we will all stand before God really and give account for the deeds on this body. Amen. Let's go on to verse three. He says, And thinkest thou of this, O man? And Paul is somewhat sarcastically asking, Do you really think this? But man in his Wickedness doesn't think the way God does. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, man, I think sometimes truly believes he's going to get away with it. And yet, he might for a little while, but one day he will stand before God. He says, Thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and do as the same? Well, the, here's these hypocrites again that they are judging. Others that are doing the same things that they're condemning others for. He said, Do us, he's asking them, Do you think that you're going to escape, or that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Be sure they will not escape the judgment of God. No Amen. will escape the judgment of God. Ecclesiastes 12 14 says, He will bring every work in judgment and every secret thing. Well, the things we hid, the things we got to hope got away with. Mm -hmm. They will all come to light before God. You're right. Amen. Let's go over to Revelation for just a moment. 
At the Great White Throne Judgment, Revelation, and the... Okay, verse 7, right on. Uh, chapter 20. Revelation 20 and verse 11, we'll start with here. Okay, so then I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. He, even at the judgment, will try to flee and hide from God. Amen. They won't be able to. Verse 12, and I saw the dead, and fallen great, stand before God. The books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Amen. And the sea gave up the dead, which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death, and the newest was not found written, and the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Amen. And even those who are dead, those who were even in the sea, he says, lost to mankind, never to be found again. Those right. We're small and great, he says. They are all going to stand before God. No, none shall escape the judgment of God. Amen. We'll turn one more place and we'll close. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, verse 31. It says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. This is the basis for the sermon John Edwards preached, sinners in the hands of an angry God. But to just stop and think to fall into the hands of a living God as a as a lost, unsaved person, that should be a very fearful thing. Amen. And he will judge us as well. He will in fact previous verse says, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 30 tells us. And it should be fearful for us that we could fall in the hand of the living God. But thanks be to God that we have Christ as our advocate. Amen. That certainly he will chastise us. Certainly we, we may have difficult times because of our sin, but ultimately we will not be condemned. For those outside of Christ, those who have never been born again, the unsaved, they will bear the full wrath of God in that lake of fire. Right. And that should be a very fearful thing. Amen. For us that are saved, it ought to be a fearful thing to consider that there's many around us that are in that condition. Yeah. Except for the grace of God, they will fall fully into the hands of this living God. Amen. We can be sure judgment is coming, but it won't be judgment according to man's judgment. So it won't be the, the little love and peace God that everyone likes today. Right. Certainly God is love, and God does have peace, and God is merciful and gracious. But on the other hand, he is righteous and just and he will condemn sin so he will not judge like I said according to the <coughs> feelings or man's standards or any of those things but he will judge according to truth mm -hmm. that would be a, really a fearful and sobering thought even for us that we will have to stand to give account before him mm -hmm. but even more so for those who don't know Christ but you want to stand and fully bear the weight of your sin. But thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift that he, that he gave us eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But we need to be careful of this hypocritical judgment, but we can be sure that God will not judge that way. Amen. We're kind of closing in the middle of a thought here, but Paul continues to deal with the judgment of God through several more verses here. Mm -hmm. We'll pick up verse 4 next week. Amen.